Hi, Lester, Wish You Engineer. Some of you may have seen Sherilyn in a few of my previous videos. She's going to be joining me in a lot more videos in the future, and as such, she's going to be adopting the title Wish You Scientist, you know, to protect her secret identity as she goes out fighting ignorance and lies using her lasso of truth, also known as the scientific method. So I want to give you a, a bit about her background and experience. She's currently completing her master's research project in sports science through the University of Southern Queensland in which she is investigating a physiological basis for the traditional martial arts concept of chi. More on that in future videos. She's been training in the Chang Hong system of Wushu for about 16 years now. Prior to that, she had been training for approximately 15 years in another physical discipline, the equine sport known as dressage. Dressage is essentially the remnants of an ancient system of martial arts on horseback. I might get the Wushu scientists to talk a little bit more about that in future videos. So today I wanted to showcase the Wushu scientists maximum force achieved on the load style load cell. She'll be using back fist strikes as we typically tend to avoid using linear forward punches against the load cell because of its rigid nature and uh, this, its rigid nature can lead to impact injuries in the joints if you're not careful. We'll cut to that video right now. What can 4,000 newtons of force do to a human body? Well, there have been many studies performed on blunt impact and its effect on human bone, and I'll leave some links to a few of those studies in the description below. 4,000 newtons of force is within the range of forces that can lead to fracture of some of the strongest bones in the human body, including the femur and the skull. The Wushu scientist is literally generating bone-breaking forces in her strikes. Of course, in reality, the nature of, of the striking object plays a significant role in the delivery of force and energy to a target. In other words, because the Wushu scientist's arm is made out of flesh and bone, it'd be harder, but not impossible, to actually break target bones with it than if she were using a rigid wooden club, for instance. So how does a 60 kilogram woman achieve a striking force that a heavier, stronger man would be proud of? Due to scientifically proven physiological differences between males and females, which are predominantly a result of different hormone levels, males are typically significantly stronger than females. Of course, there are always exceptions, both in modern times and in examples from the ranks of the great old-time strong women of the turn of the century, for instance. As an example from that era, we have Katie Brumbach, also known as the great Sandwina, who actually outperformed the great Eugene Sandow on one occasion, which is pretty incredible. But of course, these are exceptions, not the rule. And typically, males are significantly stronger than females. Striking is based partly on strength, but is also a very specialized skill that can be developed given the right kind of training. And the system of martial arts that we practice provides that kind of training. The traditional program includes kinetic chain training, stability training, core training to amplify striking force and speed, as well as timing, target sensitivity, and mental acuity. In addition to the striking training, the traditional curriculum also incorporates joint locking, grappling, and manipulation, a part of the system called China. 
The striking and grappling are both integrated into a seamless package that provides a fluid response that can adapt to changing scenarios. If you are interested in learning self-defense, striking is a critical must-have skill because it will typically favor a weaker defender. Let me explain why. Note that I'm going to be making some generalized statements here and remember that there are always exceptions to every rule. Grappling typically, typically involves committing or locking into a single opponent for a certain length of time. That time may be long and it may be short, depending on what's being done. It also typically involves slower movement or more static stances. Very often it leads to ground-based fighting and grappling. These factors can lead to compromised mobility for the defender. In addition, although grappling is very technically is also very technically dependent in that a weaker opponent can beat a stronger opponent by virtue of superior technique and application, there is less margin for error because of the compromised mobility and the locked in close proximity with the attacker. If a defender misses with a punch or a kick, they will typically be able to remain more mobile than a defender who has failed to apply a grappling technique effectively. It is important to note that many stronger opponents typically gravitate towards grappling approaches because it allows them to tie up and overwhelm weaker opponents. Bearing this in mind, in situations where one is fighting against physically stronger opponents or against more than one opponent, it may be tactically necessary to remain as mobile as possible and this may involve predominantly using striking techniques and using grappling techniques only sparingly or to set up opportunities um, for follow-up attacks. A kind of hit and run tactic to wear down superior opponents or, uh, or, uh, or a superior opponent or superior opponents. In terms of self-defense for both men and women this really highlights the need for effective striking training since the opponent or opponents that they may be facing could very well be physically stronger than they are. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please leave a like and a comment below and subscribe if you're so inclined. Cheers, I'll see you next time.